actually, Katie. There are a lot of species that have been given this protection, but one of the questions we always have is, do they actually need it? So there's two layers of protection that the ESA, the Endangered Species Act, that's what I'm going to call it because it rolls off tongue a little easier. Um, there's two levels of protection that it provides. The first is protection for endangered animals. And those are animals that are in immediate danger of becoming extinct, literally being wiped off the face of the earth. And then there are threatened animals. So those are animals that may become endangered in the near future. So it's like a stair step. And right now, there are about 1,660 species. I think my last check was exactly 1,663 species that are protected by the Act. And those could be, and those are all animal species. There are plant species as well, and that number doesn't um, contain those. In Arizona alone, we have 44 endangered species and 21 threatened species. Wow, that seems like a lot. Can you give us uh, some examples of what could be endangered and what could be threatened specifically here in Arizona? Sure, probably the most common one, maybe everybody knows it, the Mexican gray wolf. So that is an endangered species here in Arizona that especially the ag community is concerned about. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about it later. A lot of fish in Arizona, the Apache trout, the Colorado pike memo, minnow, the Gila trout, black-footed ferret is also on the endangered list, um, as well as the um, Chiricahua leopard frog, and um, another one that's pretty common is the desert tortoise. And one of the things that I'm noticing with some of these is they're a lot older. They've been protected for longer, like the black-footed ferret. I've heard of that forever. Yeah. Um, that was back in 1967. But right. And of course, we have the Mexican gray wolf. Was that newer? Is that more recent or is that an older one as well? Mexican gray wolf is also older. The ferret that you mentioned and the Apache trout, a couple of them have actually been on the list since the ESA was enacted. So they've been around, that they've literally been on the list since there was a list to be on. Um, most recent ones are um, the frog and the jaguar actually has become a threatened species in Arizona. And those ones have been um, kind of in this decade. Okay. So it's always changing, always evolving. All right. So we talked about what the ESA's purpose is. So how does it um, accomplish that purpose? What is it supposed to prevent? Well, the ESA prevents taking. And taking means a whole lot of things. The official definition has a whole laundry list. Harassing, harming, pursuing, hunting, shooting, the things that we would normally think of as taking the animal, right? But it also involves attempting to engage in that behavior or pretty much anything that's likely to lead to a take. So that means that taking under the Endangered Species Act includes grazing. It includes construction, development, anything that's going to affect the habitat that that animal lives on. That can include recreational activities too, hunting of course, but also just camping, using an ATV, um, something that's going to be out there in the habitat that the animal uses. And then of course, vegetation management. So if it's a bird, for example, the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, and we're trying to get rid of mesquite on our um, farm because we need the plant where the mesquite is, that may be a protected activity because that's where the Willow Flycatcher lives. So anything, even weed removal, um, may be considered a potential take under the Endangered Species Act. This seems like it's a lot more broad and complex than just we want to save these animals. Yeah, it, it has a lot more repercussions than I think a lot of people recognize. Absolutely. And one of the big repercussions and a good example of that is critical habitat. So the ESA applies and you can't take that animal under the critical habitat where it's been designated. And so the ESA or the Fish and Wildlife Service will look at where that animal lives and decide, okay, this is the critical habitat. This is where that animal lives. This is where we really need to protect what's happening to that animal. Um, and if you happen to be a landowner or a land user within that critical habitat, you have to get permission to do whatever that activity is that might be considered to take. And so to do that, you have to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service. And if you are on federal land, your federal agency has to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service. So easy way to figure that out is an example. So if you're a rancher and you have a federal land lease, whether it's with the BLM or the Forest Service, and you've decided that you need to build a fence or um, build a water tank, you have to let the BLM consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service to decide whether that's going to be acceptable on this critical habitat, whether that's going to be something that you can do because it's not going to impact that species or maybe you won't be able to do it because it will impact that species. You have so to it could take 
potentially years to yeah. be able to get the approval to put a fence on your uh, operation. Exactly. And so that's really been one of the big issues with the ESA. You know, you talk about it and you think, well, absolutely, species recovery is something we want. We want to make sure that we're protecting our ecosystems. We want to make sure we're farmers and we're ranchers and we understand kind of the complexities mm -hmm. of how animals interact with each other. And when one animal species goes away, that could have ripple effects on other animal species down the line, down the food chain. And we get that. Um, but the problem is that the best of intentions sometimes can really go awry when you see how they work out on the ground. And I think there's three kind of major pressure points with the Endangered Species Act, especially um, government inefficiency, abuse by activists and burden on private industry. So we'll talk a little bit about sort of all three of those. So we talk about government inefficiency and Katie mentioned this just now. The scope of this act is massive, and so the government can't really take care of massive legislation in inefficient time. And there's a couple reasons for that, especially. We talked about how there are, you know, currently over 1,600 listings. In 1973, there were only 109. Wow. So that's a huge increase in really how many things this act all of a sudden, not all of a sudden because it's been since the 1970s, but how many things that this act now protects and how many things the government has to review. And I think it's kind of shown that it's not been effective because less than 3% of those species have actually been recovered. So if the purpose of the act is to recover species and we have 1,600 species covered by the act, but only 3% of them have been recovered, that's probably that's kind of like not working. That's like six species have been recovered if we're taking it out of the 1600. Yeah. If you're looking there. at that. Around there. That's insane. It's, it's not easy. And when we talk about landowners and what they need to do to be wise stewards of their land, that's where that lack of timely consultations comes in. If you're a rancher, you have federal land leases, you need to be able to do things in a timely manner to take care of your herd, to take care of your land, make sure that it's sustainable. But if it takes two to four up to 10 years for the BLM or the Forest Service to consult with Fish and Wildlife, you can't make those decisions. And that's something pretty important to recognize because if you're thinking of our ranchers here in Arizona, one of the things that a lot of them do is they provide tanks. They provide water not only for their livestock, but for the wildlife in the area as well. And so sometimes they've got to put in water lines and pipes. So would they have to go through all of these layers to be able to bring that water into their operation as well? Yeah, they would if they're on a federal lease. And that federal lease happens to be on land where there's a critical habitat designation, then that's going to happen. And a great example, we have one rancher in Arizona. We'll talk a little bit more about their ranch coming up too. They've got seven layers of critical habitat on their ranch. So this isn't just a hypothetical either. This really is something that's happening to our ranchers in Arizona and across the nation. So it's something we're dealing with every single day. There's another little wrinkle um, in the Endangered Species Act that actually isn't the fault of the ESA. It's the fault of another piece of legislation. And that piece of legislation is called the Equal Access to Justice Act. It sounds like a great act, right? We all want that. We all want justice. I want access to justice. Um, but what this act has allowed private citizens to do is sue the federal government if they think the federal government isn't doing what the federal government is supposed to do. So what this has led to is environmental activist groups will take a look at all of those 1,600 species that have been listed and all of the different deadlines that the government has to meet because of that listing. And the moment they find a deadline that hasn't been missed or hasn't been capped, which is pretty easy because there's 1,600 <laughs> species, right. um, they file a suit and they say, hey, Fish and Wildlife Service, we're suing you because you haven't done what you are um, statutorily um, entitled to do under the ESA. And that's that's what you're supposed to do, and we're going to sue you for that because you're harming us as citizens. So the Equal Access to Justice Act not only allows them to do that, it also says that if you sue the federal government and you win, you get your attorney's fees paid. Wow. And so what happens is 
Environmental activist groups find these lawsuits that are easy wins because they're straightforward deadlines. They sue the Fish and Wildlife Service. Rather than going to court over them, the Fish and Wildlife Service will settle and they'll say, okay, no, we didn't meet that deadline. So give us six months or give us two years or whatever might seem like a, a, a good deadline or a feasible deadline for them to hit. Then they settle and then the activist group gets attorney's fees, which by the way, that attorney might say, okay, just kidding, I'm donating this back to this group. And right. then they use that as a funding source for what they're doing. And so rather than, you know, using those resources well and using them to actually do things that recover species, we're just kind of paying out groups to, to have this cycle of litigation. So that money then, if they lose through the activist group because mm -hmm. they're not meeting these deadlines, is that money that could actually be used like to get more employees to help them sure. uh, get through these deadlines? So Yeah, I mean, it's, it's taxpayer dollars that okay. are dedicated to this agency. And so that could be used for either its employees or administrative work or recovery projects on the ground, you know, whatever it might be. Instead of being used in a very productive manner that way, it's being used in sort of this black hole of litigation. So it does definitely sound like the equal access to justice is one of those double-edged swords, yeah, right? It was precisely. meant for something specific, and people are taking wide brush strokes and, and using it for not what it was intended to be used for. Yeah, so, that's right. And we are very encouraged right now. Um, the current administration has issued an executive order saying, hey, we need to re revisit the Equal Access to Justice sure. Act, because one of the big things, you know, I, I was trying to look for some specific examples of groups that have done this, but a lot of these agreements are actually confidential. So it means that we know that this is happening because groups are excited about it and they brag about it, but we can't track the money and where it's going. And so one of the things the administration has said is we need to have accountability and transparency. So we're working with um, the current Fish and Wildlife Service and the current executive administration to say, okay, how do we make the terms of these agreements public so that we can say, hey, look at how much money this group got through Sue and Settle or this group got through Sue and Settle. And if they're asking for such transparency through agriculture, it would only make sense that they should have to do the same in return. That's right. right. Yeah. Absolutely. So hopefully they're successful on that. Bit. Turnabout is fair play sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> So, and then finally, I think what our members, especially here at Farm Bureau, look at the most with the ESA is the burden that it has on private landowners, where we've talked about just how hard it is to get things done if you have land that's on critical habitat. And one of the problems, I think we would all be happy to, you know, jump through some of those hoops if it actually meant protecting the species mm -hmm. that it was supposed to protect, but critical habitat sometimes isn't actually critical for that species. Do you have an example? I do have an example. There's a ranch in southern Arizona. It's near Reddington. Um, so if you know where that is, it's very much the desert. I've been there a couple of times. Beautiful desert, but it's desert. And there were, at one point, five layers of critical habitat on that ranch for fish. Wait, I've been to that ranch. Yes, you have. And there's no running stream. No. There's, it's all dry washes. All dry washes. And how many fish? Five. Five fish. Five fish. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, the Mexican gray wolf is another example. We've got a ton of critical habitat in Arizona and New Mexico for the wolf, but about 1% of historical Mexican gray wolf habitat is in the U.S. The rest of it's in Mexico. But we put all of this critical habitat in the U.S. hoping that we could maybe recover it in places that it's actually never been before. If that... That's not the purpose of the ESA, though. It's really not. Okay. The purpose of the ESA is to recover species in places where it makes sense to recover those species. Okay. And if the habitat doesn't have biological features that are necessary for that species Water, to recover. Water, for fish. Precisely. Okay. Yeah, great, great okay. example. Then there's really no point in designating that as critical habitat. All that is is a way to look at that private landowner and say, hey, we're going to put all these restrictions on the way that you okay. use your land. Or even a federal leaseholder and say, we're going to put all these restrictions on the, the land that you have the right to use through that lease that you own. And we just talked about the gray wolf, but huge issue with the ESA. Protected species are direct predators of a lot of the things that we grow, whether it's the Mexican gray wolf in Arizona, whether it's the gray wolf in the Great Plains and up in Montana, Yellowstone area. Um, it has just been 
costly and deadly, literally, to the agricultural, the livestock industry of some of those places. The Mexican gray wolf experimental population in Arizona has cost ranchers literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's not just because wolves eat livestock. That absolutely happens. But there are bigger costs, too, because ranchers have to then keep their livestock away from wolves. And that causes stress on their livestock because they're trying to move them. It causes stress on their livestock when there are wolves in the area. Mm -hmm. And just like us, when livestock get stressed, we they don't eat well. They don't sleep well. Just their health goes downhill. Mm -hmm. And so that means that as ranchers, they're not raising the healthy livestock that they want to raise. And so that's going to cost them money on the back end, too. And it's just um, it's a huge nightmare for people who are trying to let wolves and cattle, quote unquote, coexist. It's not possible. Well, and one of the things that I've heard with the wolves specifically is that there is a fund. So mm -hmm. so let's say a wolf comes in and takes out some of your herd, you're eligible to recoup some of the funds. But how does that work? How do the farmers and ranchers, what proof do they have to be able to provide to say 100% that that was a wolf? Mm -hmm. So what ends up having to happen is there's got to be a governmental agency that verifies that that animal was killed by a wolf. The problem with that is that means that you have to keep the animal there after it's been killed. Then the government official has to come out and look at the animal to verify that it's been killed by a wolf. If it takes them two days to do that, another animal may have come and started eating on right. the carcass as well. Right, and these are some very remote places yeah, that this is happening. Yeah, exactly. And so that's a very difficult administrative okay. nightmare. And it's never a guarantee that they're going to be recompensated for that either. Um, sometimes, you know, the, it'll be determined, well, maybe it wasn't a wolf kill. We can't determine whether it was or it wasn't. And then there's just a timely process to go through to get compensated too. And, you know, that it's only compensation for things that have actually been killed. It doesn't right. account Take into for account all the stress and the, the things you're putting in place, the management things you're right. putting in place to try and avoid it in the first place. Yeah, that's sure. absolutely right. Wow. Um, that's a lot on the landowners. It is. It's a lot. And it, it really is detrimental to the industry. Um, and so I think, you know, we talk about that and a lot of people kind of say, all right, well, I don't live on critical habitat and I'm not in the ranching industry and I personally really like endangered species, so I'm still cool with this. But there's actually a little wrinkle that I've kind of recently learned about that makes a lot of sense. And it's that thanks to the Endangered Species Act, we've actually had thousands of acres removed from our tax bases. So if you are a school teacher or yeah, a school student, funny or someone who uses public roads, um, you should really care about that. So let me, I'll give you an example of how that works. Um, it's in Pima County, and they have um, something called the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. And basically what that meant was that, okay, there's a lot of critical habitat in our county, a lot of endangered or threatened species here, but we still want to develop in Pima County. Makes mm -hmm. perfect sense. Absolutely, that's the goal of every county, right? We want economic activity. So to get permission from the Fish and Wildlife Service to take through development, they also had to promise to take a certain amount of land out of consideration for development. So like, all right, we might build on this owl habitat, but we're going to save all this owl habitat over here where people are less likely to want houses and stores and schools and that kind of stuff. And so they place a conservation easement on the land that's less likely to be developed. So that okay. means that basically you can't really do anything with that land. It's there for conservation purposes. They develop the land, the other habitat. And that means that now instead of saying, hey, let's do some moderate development or different kinds of development in different places, we said we're developing here and we're never developing here. Okay. We've taken land out of the tax base completely. And so now that's because the ESA required them to do that. You have to pick and choose which land will be economic contribution okay. and which land isn't going to be economic contribution. So that's just one of those decisions that the ESA now requires us to make through statutory issues that we probably could have made maybe in different ways. Maybe private industry could have made that decision. Maybe private landowners could have made that decision. Yeah, and let's hope the people who are making this decision made the right decision. Right. Because if they didn't, there's no going back. That's right. Because you built where you built and you can't where you can't. Yeah. So oh, the wow. ESA has definitely added some wrinkles and some complication um, to whether it's private industry or public development that maybe weren't anticipated through the bill in the 1970s when it was enacted, but it definitely become something that we are living with with the ESA so, on a daily basis. So as we're learning, there's there's definitely some issues with this well-intended act, right? Mm -hmm. Endangered Species Act. So 
what are some of the things that are happening here at Farm Bureau and with your team uh, to help our members sort of weed through all mm -hmm. of these different pieces of the act and, and helping them uh, sort of clean some of this up for the future? Clean up is definitely the right term to use. So I think it's probably, there's maybe a public perception among some people that it's like, well, landowners, farmers, ranchers, they just want to get rid of it entirely. Definitely not what we're doing because we understand that ecosystems are important and threatened species are important. But what we do want to do is modernize the act. We want to streamline the act. And so to do that, we just want to make the decisions that the act makes make sense. And so we want those decisions to be made on real, justifiable, peer-reviewed science, right? And probably that would mean that if there's no water on your ranch, it's not going to be deemed critical fish habitat. And currently, that's maybe not the case, and that's because the timeline that they have to work with. So they're having to speed through so they can't look at all of the research? It's or partially because okay. of the timeline and it's partially because of litigation too. And so what ends up happening is that instead of scientists making the decisions, judges make the okay. decisions. And you know, I worked for judges for quite a few years and I <laughs> love them, but scientists, they are not. And um, I just think that scientists should make scientific uh, decisions. Those of you who know me know I love science, so <laughs> I'm on board with that 100%. I believe in science. All right. And, uh, you know, just another, you know, example of that, if example spotted in the U.S. doesn't mean that the an animal has habitat in the U.S. Right. right. They could just cross over the border for a visit. Somebody happened to take a picture. Do that all the time. Exactly. Yeah. Male panthers have, like, this huge range, but okay. they don't actually, like, live here. They pass through. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So we support science, we support realistic timelines, and we believe that the longer we wait, the more it costs everyone, the more it costs not just our landowners, not just our mm -hmm. farmers and our ranchers, but also the species that we're trying to protect. Waiting doesn't help anybody. Well, yeah, if we've only done six since 1973. Three. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes. yes, time. That's a good one. Time is a good one. And so we're really excited that just last week, in fact, a week ago today, um, our president, Arizona Farm Bureau President Stephanie Smallhouse, headed out to Washington, D.C. to be present for the rule signing of a new modernization of the Endangered Species Act. Now, if you've been watching the news, you probably haven't heard people say how excited they are about this modernization. You've heard quite the like opposite. Detrimental mm -hmm. and cutting legs out from under and sky is falling. Um, that's not the case. It really, really isn't. Uh, the most important part about this rulemaking is that how it's going to impact the resources we're using with the ESA. Didn't change any of the language of the ESA. You can't do that through a rulemaking, just FYI. It is a okay, statute. Yeah. You'd have to do that through legislation. Yeah, okay. This is just the rules that enact the ESA, so that guide the agencies that enact it. And these rules recognize that resources are finite. So if you're spending money in one place, like litigation, you're not spending it in another place, like consultation with agencies. So it's more of an administrative change as right. opposed to a rule change. Yeah, exactly. So it seems pretty simple. Exactly. But I've definitely heard the activists and the folks on TV and social media who are trying to inform people that they're trying to get it thrown out. They don't care right. about the animals. And, and so I think that's, that's very difficult then for consumers to understand because it is so complex. People think it's about just saving animals and don't realize everything that, that goes into it. And I think now is just a time where people are going to be more confused. So I'm glad you're mentioning that today. Yeah, absolutely. And so what we're really hoping is that this new rulemaking is going to kind of emphasize efficiency over paperwork. Okay. And so we're looking at things like um, simplifying that consultation process if you're trying to do a project on your federal land. Um, if you're it's emphasizing the delisting process, so we've talked about we've only recovered that 3% of species. There are probably species out there that are recovered, but we just don't have a good process for saying that they've been recovered. So they're still there. Right. Or once they've been recovered, that's blocked in litigation because, well, no, actually, even though you said you only needed 160, um, what you really needed was, you know, 300 and mm -hmm. trying to get the courts to decide that. Um, so we're excited about that process as well and just think that this is a great opportunity for us to, to look at this act and say we want it to actually bring it back to its purpose of recovering endangered and threatened species. 
That's what it's supposed to do. How do we make it do that and get rid of all the other junk that it's kind of not been doing well? Awesome. I like that. Makes sense to me. That's right. So one of the things uh, that we promised you guys that we would provide when we talk about any of the issues throughout this year is a place to go to get more information, right? Not just that you heard it from Chelsea or Katie on a webinar, but where can you go get that solid scientific information or the actual language that's happening with a rule, a bill, an act in this case. Um, and so Chelsea pulled up some of these ones that I think are good resources to check out, um, especially concerning uh, the ESA. Yeah, absolutely. So of course, I'm always gonna tell you to go check out the American Farm Bureau because they're doing this work um, even on a greater scale than we're doing it, of course. And so they have some really great resources that they compile for you that are easy to digest, easy to read. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to have a lot more information and just kind of very, um, this is what the law is, this is what the policy is. And I put the Congressional Western Caucus. Now, I'm not going to say that it's going to be unbiased necessarily, but it might give you a perspective that's harder to find than what you can find through just like a simple Google search. Um, and if you're looking for particular acts or legislation, or rule changes that are not in the mainstream or not um, really popular right now, the Congressional Western Caucus is a good place to look because it's actually the legislators who are out there saying, hey, I want to try to do this. Okay. So it's new ideas that maybe aren't getting a lot of traction, but you could think, hey, that's interesting. Maybe let's, let's explore how that might work. So. so if people wanted to follow along outside of social media with how this administrative change is going, is there some place they could go to – stay up on this issue or follow it, you know, specifically as you're taking it to the governor and trying to get a signature yeah, or whatever. Yeah, so it's a federal issue, so this one will be a, won't need like a president's signature or anything because it is just an agency okay. rulemaking. But Congressional Western Caucus and Fish and Wildlife Service are going to be the two best places there. And then, of course, check out the Arizona Farm Bureau Twitter, Arizona Farm Bureau blog. Every time we have an update, we'll be writing our hearts out to make sure you guys know what that update is. And one of the things um, that we're going to be rolling out here in the high school ag classrooms uh, this week is our while you were working. And I know that's actually the first time this hit my radar is you sent that out to everybody. Uh, it's a nice little two page, one page front and back where Chelsea really takes the issues that are happening, um, breaks it down, gives sort of an editorial uh, look at what the issue is. And on the backside spotlight, um, some of the bills and things that are happening. Um, and so one of the ones that's coming your way actually this week happens to be on the ESA. So you'll be able to get some more information from that as well. So lots of different places to go, but I think these are three great websites to be able to pop in. Definitely. Now, um, as many of you may or may not know, uh, one of my roles is to help with the Ag Issues Contest for FFA. So as important as it is for you guys just to generally understand issues that are happening in agriculture, um, we want to make it a little bit easier for you to take some of these issues and conversations that we're having and turn them into uh, a topic for your Ag Issues contest. Um, so at the end of each webinar, we'll go ahead and give you guys some ideas on how you could take uh, this specific topic and use it as part of the contest. So what are some of your suggestions for this one? So as I was thinking through it, there's really kind of two ways that I think I would go. The first is take a particular species or a proposed listing for a species and just say, should the X animal be added to the list of endangered and threatened species okay. and why or why not? Because you could take a lot of the science that you could find about here's its population, here's what's threatening its population, here's the burden it'll have on the landowners and land users within the critical habitat. I think that there's just a lot of logical ways to make that argument. And then, of course, you always have the other side right. from the environmentalist. That's right. And, and so, so there's a yes yeah. or a okay. no. And so there's, there's a very easy way not to take it side. Um, and then the other way is a little more abstract, but probably kind of interesting. And it's how do you take the act as a whole? And the question is, is it working? Yes or no. Oh. And so, you know, you can look at, okay, okay, it's only been 3% of species, but then species? you can look at, you know, what's the number and how is it recovered? And okay. so I think there's also, that's a yes or no question too. You know, does the act work? Yep. Or is it fulfilling its purpose? Um, and there's a lot of information you can get on both sides. Awesome. 
Well, I hope that was helpful for you guys. We are going to open the time now. If anybody has any questions, feel free to throw them out there. Uh, teachers who are on board or even students. If you guys have uh, any feedback, please feel free to send me an email, katieakins at azfc.org, because um, we are uh, planning on doing these each month. Mm -hmm. So if there's an issue that you'd like us to cover, please let us know that as well, because we can slide those in at any time. So hit us with your questions. It's a quiet group today, Katie. It Monday is. It, it's Monday morning at 10. I get it. But we're still going to give you just a minute in case you happen to be peck and fine typers. That's right. That's uh, right. might take a little bit of time. But As you're thinking of your questions, too, and Katie's kind of already mentioned it, but we do have a weekly newsletter that's going to be sent out um, to you as ag teachers so that you can share it with your students. But if you're interested in kind of um, getting that to your personal inbox, there is a way to do that. If you go to azfb.org, click on the public policy section, and sign up for our actions alert. That's going to send that directly to your inbox every week, as well as any action alerts that we have when we want you to reach out to your state representatives or congressional representatives to say, hey, this is a change that needs to be made. Okay, guess what? Bing, we bing, 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 we have a question. So we have a question from a student at AAEC Australia Mountain. And that is, what rules or guidelines have changed with the ESA? Yeah. So there's a lot that's going on with the rulemaking, but I think one of the most important ones to highlight is that when we talked about critical habitat, fish with no water, um, one of the changes in the rulemaking is that there's now a requirement that there's a critical biological feature in the critical habitat that the animal depends on for survival. So fish and water is a really good example. If the critical habitat doesn't contain that biological feature or at least one biological feature that that animal needs to survive, then it's not going to be listed in the critical habitat. Okay. I think that's going to take a lot of layers of new critical habitat off where it doesn't need to be. Makes sense. Yeah. Hopefully that answered you guys' question. Good example. <laughs> Any more hunt and find? Well, what we're going to do, um, just to give a little bit more time, if anybody's typing questions, um, we're actually going, uh, we've recorded this webinar, so it's going to be available on our website, azfb.org backslash AITC. Um, it'll also be available on azfb.org if you go to our government relations page as well. So yeah. there's going to be lots of ways to find it. I will actually email out the link to all of the ag teachers once it's up on the web page. Um, so you can just click that, uh, click that link from your email as well, and it'll take you there so you can watch it anytime. Um, if you are watching this after the fact and you have any questions, please feel free to shoot an email to myself, Katie Akins, at azfb.org, or to myself, Chelsea McGuire, at azfb.org. Awesome. Well, I hope this was helpful. Chelsea, thanks for popping in with us this morning. I think going to be it. our face every time we do this. Um, I'm grateful that we have an expert here. So hopefully it was helpful to you guys, and uh, we'll touch base with you next month. Thanks, everyone.